to our show. And you might be wondering. Oh, okay. Well, hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to the Law Scholar Show. I'm Selena. And I'm Ure. And welcome to our show. <laughs> so you might be wondering what we're doing here and we are a part of a really cool organization called clever communities in action so you know would you like to tell them a little bit more about it sure clever communities in action focuses on the promotion and placement of culturally affirming literature in order to improve literacy rates build community okay. and heal traumas inflicted by systemic racism within the african-american community Ure, why don't you go ahead and tell us a few of the Clever Communities organizations? Yes, one part of the program that is really cool to me is the Read to Lead program. It is a school-based initiative that promotes literacy, positive self-esteem, and cultural awareness through literature with a focus on African-American students. Through Read to Lead, CCA has distributed over 3,000 culturally affirming books to dozens of Title I elementary libraries in Hampton Roads and Flint, Michigan. This has granted access to over 7,000 elementary students since 2011. One of the organizations that some of you might be familiar with is the Virtual Village Show, born from the 2020 COVID-19 school closures, is now on its fifth season. Every Wednesday at 1 p.m., hosted by kids for kids. Tune in for readings of African-American children's books about various topics, Black history facts, and check out our supplementary online learning portal. Another one of our organizations would be the Reading Theater Readers, which utilizes the barbershop to promote a love for reading while providing mentorship in a fun and effective way. You can learn more about all of these programs and us, the Law Scholars, at clarecommunities.org. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce a few of our fellow law scholars. Hey everyone, I'm Gianna Lee and I am an upcoming freshman at the George Mason University. So go Patriots! Woo! Woo! Hi, I'm Calissa and I am a rising senior at Kempsville High School and I am hoping to pursue architecture in college. Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm a rising sophomore at the wonderful home of Pilots, Norby High School. All right, Jordan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a law scholar? All right, okay, so yeah. So basically, we're gonna start with the acronym LAW. So the acronym stands for Literacy as a Weapon. We are a group of seven, seven African-American youth who read a book called The Color of Law. So The Color of Law is a New York Times notable nonfiction novel that describes the implications of redlining and basically every Saturday, we break down each chapter of the book. We're, we also work to educate ourselves as African-American children in America, as well as educating others. So we actually have seven law scholars. However, one of them couldn't be here with us today, which is Kennedy because she had something else going on. However, we do have another law scholar that we didn't have on our last show. So I'm going to introduce to y'all Justice and I'm gonna let him talk about himself. Hey, Justice. Hello, um, again, my name is Justice. I'm going into my senior year at Manor High School. Y'all might better know it. Y'all might know it. What? Y'all might know it better as Woodrow Wilson High School because we just changed our name. And I became a law scholar because I would like to further my knowledge on the history of African Americans. Yes, so everyone, welcome, Justice. Hey, Justice. Hey. And you guys might see these really cool things on our shirts. These are our Law Scholar shirts. And the symbol on it is an Adinkra symbol called Fawudi. And this symbol means independence and emancipation. It originated in Ghana and it is now very popular in all of West Africa. And hopefully America soon too. We really want you guys to go and look into it. It's really cool. There's a bunch of symbols like these and you can find out which one means the most to you. Right, so first up, we're gonna go into public housing. Um, we're gonna have Diani Lee and Kalissa take that away. <laughs> All right, 
So basically, public housing started in World War One. They would basically just put housing around industries where they would create weapons and food factories that were turned into basically, well, they were kind of renovated for war, where you see rationing and everything like that. And then it kind of started to pick up public housing specifically with the New Deal because of the Great Depression, and they were trying to create, um, they were trying to combat the housing crisis, essentially. Yes, they were trying to, they wanted, at first, like she said, public housing was for people coming in for industrial purposes, trying to find jobs. And when you're up there you, in a big city, you need a place to live. You, most people can't just live anywhere. And with so many people misplaced, they needed a place for them to go. So the government set up public housing, and this was specifically for white people. Now you're thinking, you know, public housing nowadays is for black people, but right, in, but back then it was specifically for white people only. So you're thinking, where did black people go? <laughs> they went. They didn't have anywhere to go. They had makeshift shanty town houses. If I'm correct. So with the New Deal, and the New Deal is went off. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was in office and you learn about this a lot in school and you learn that the New Deal is something that's really good, but you don't really learn the way that it's actually not and how it kind of pushed black people down the ladder again and again, because what the New Deal did in 1933 was create the Public Works Administration, which is also known as the PWA, that's the acronym for it. And basically, what they did was segregate houses. So one third of housing created by the PWA was dedicated to African-Americans and the rest was dedicated to white people. And they didn't actually begin creating these segregated housing, like public housing specifically, until 1935, where they went to Techwood, Atlanta. And this place was already integrated. It had black and white people living together, but the PWA recreated it into a public house like a housing complex that was segregated. So they turned it into an all white community. This further displaced black people. And then when you get into how more public housing popped up during World War II specifically because they needed industries, they needed people to be around these industries. So they'd send the military to live there. And Dion, do you wanna continue that for me? Yes, so when they, I'm sorry. Got a little lost for a moment, but they would send people who had just finished from the war. They would give them money to go and have a house for their own. And these are white people, might add you. So all the white people are really leaving public housing at this point to go and have their own home, their own piece of property with um, loans from the government and from the banks. And that leaves the black people now in these public housings that are really old at this point. It's been there for five plus years, hasn't really been well kept anymore. Because because after white people are in there and they leave, their services leave with that. They don't leave their resources behind for us to use to help make our place nicer and cleaner. They leave it dirty and displaced and dismembered us. Basically adding on to what the audience said, after the war, they had money. Like these people were getting paid money. They had black and white people making not the same wages, but some of them had similar wages. And then along with the New Deal, they created the Home Loans Organization, which basically gave mortgages so that people could go and buy single family homes because that's what they were trying to encourage with the New Deal was kind of bolstering our economy back up to, I guess, save capitalism. And so they, they would give white people loans and then they wouldn't allow black people to have mortgages. So they would be stuck in these public housing that eventually became, I guess, slums and ghettos because there was no resources around them. And they they had no way of gaining access to these resources to, I guess, revamp, refertilize their neighborhoods. And even though it's public housing, they still have to pay. It's not completely free. So they're trying to find a good paying job and pay for their living environment and how can you expect somebody to do all that with the little money that you give them and also make sure that they have the supplies to make their house smell clean and sweep the rug and all that extra stuff that comes with having a place of your own living. 
And then going back with the homeowners loans corporation, they actually created red line maps. So they would do this by choosing areas that were low income and predominantly African American, and they would label these as red. So that's where you get the red and the red lining maps as risks. So kind of like it's kind of like when you have credit where you have to go out and get a loan based on if you have good enough credit. They did that, but they would base it on race. So that's why black people wouldn't get mortgages. Because they were in case they they literally could not get the finance to have one. And it's just mm -hmm. it's so surprising how purposefully and how intentfully they went out of their way to make sure we didn't have any kind of housing or any kind of property of our own. Yeah. The way they deliberately did everything for oh no, you don't qualify not because of race, but because maybe you're a little too too short or something like that. They make up anything just to make sure we had nothing. And if they label your neighborhood as a risk, it could just be one, it could be one black person in your neighborhood and it would be labeled as a, as a risk. They would actually call this a uh, Negro invasion. Yep. And basically when a black person moved into the neighborhood, everybody would just kind of scurry out because they thought that the people thought that black people being in their neighborhood would make the property value go down. And to be back off what she said, when that happens, if you think about it, in all actuality, it makes your property value go up because of the supply and demand. We black people are we're in such demand of having a place of their own. There's some places to call their own to have a, their own property that they were able, they were willing to pay thousands upon thousands overpriced property just to have it. That's just your property value going up, not down. So oh it God. just shows how. Um, Twisted, I think, in the moment they're, they're thinking was. It was very backwards thinking to me. So I think we kind of wrapped up what we needed to say, and I hope it was easy enough for y'all to follow along. So I'm going to introduce Justice so that he can um, define the difference between two types of segregation, de jure and de facto. So we are going to. Hello again. Um, right now, I'm here to, to separate the differences differences between de jure segregation and de facto segregation. To begin, de jure segregation in Latin, de jure means by law, which means that it's segregation set in place by law, like Jim Crow laws and other legislative pieces that made it so black people were restrained and couldn't get the same opportunities as white people. But de facto is by choice or by facts, which means that they had the choice in being like segregated. For example, like white people not wanting to be in the same, not wanting to be in the same neighborhood as black people, but just based off the fact that they're black or like not being able to sit the front of the bus because, or not being able to drink from the same water fountain because they don't want their water to be contaminated by Negro Americans. So also in chapter 10 of the book, in chapter 10 of the book, the author went over how he went over, the author talked about how the government made it seem like most of the segregation that happened in the past was the fact that it was just how it was just that white people didn't want to associate with black people, although that is not true. In reality, it was the jury segregation because the legislation set in place made it so that black communities couldn't flourish and they also couldn't didn't have the same opportunities as white people just based off of their color. And also along with redlining and other stuff, it made it so that um, the income was different. So they couldn't get like, they couldn't move to wealthier places and they also made it. So it made it, it just gave a bad look on us. It made everybody seem poor. Even if you had money during this time, you didn't get the same opportunities as white people just based off the sole fact that you were African-American. So yeah, that's all I have to say on de jure and de facto segregation. Yes, that was so good, Justice. Thank you for telling us about that. Now we are going to engage in yeah, open discussion about that. public housing. So Diani, I know you had some personal relationships with that topic. You'd like to tell us about it? Yes. So my great grandpa, he was part of the Marine Corps in the 19, 
1951, I believe, he served for two years. And during that time, after you serve for about two years, I believe you're able to become a veteran and you get benefits like a lot of other military people did during that time. And he did his cert two years and he got, um, he got honorably discharged and he wanted to, because he had a family by that time, he wanted to, you know, move into a house, use that money that the government gave him to get a house for his family and to really just settle down and be in a good neighborhood and environment. And they had to go into public housing for about 10 some years because they were unable to get a house in the environment and in the, um, in the place that they wanted to, in the neighborhood that they wanted to. They went out to Long Island, because this was in New York, and they said no. They went here, they said no. And soon he figured out that he could not get a house in the area that he wanted to because of things like redlining and the things that they put in place for him not to, to get a good house in a good area. Thankfully, eventually he was able to get a house in Jamaica, but I think that just goes to show how real it was and how difficult it was because he told his, um, his son, who, who told me all this information, he let me know that he was so frustrated because he felt like he served his country for two years. He put out everything. He did anything and everything that they told him to do. And he comes back and he expected so much, not so much more in the return, but I think he expected to get the same sacrifice and appreciation. I, I think that's what he really wanted at the end of the day. He wanted to be appreciated. And I feel like he didn't feel appreciated because he couldn't get the simplest thing as a good house in a good neighborhood for his own family. That's like super heartbreaking because a lot of times like racist people, they say like they're going to like prioritize veterans, but at the end of the day, like they really don't. And a lot of veterans are like the main ones, like not the main ones, but they are like a big category of people who are like affected by stuff like this. And it, you have like the perfect example of someone who saw like someone's race over what they did to like serve our country. And one yeah. of the things, oh, sorry, go ahead. But no. I, I just want to say that one of the things that doesn't really have to do with public housing, but something that they did that they did put in place to prevent specifically black men and, and women from getting a good job after being in the military or anything like that was law enforcement. After getting out of the military, a lot of people want to do law enforcement or stay in government work which is exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted so badly to believe, be a police officer. However, during that time, you had there was a higher department. You had to be 5'8", which sounds ridiculous nowadays, but he was 5'7", and he could not be a police officer for that one reason. But I think we all know there was another reason behind that. I think that's just crazy to the fact that they used something so little as a height factoring because it was a very common statistic that black people are not very tall especially back then you they weren't very tall they were <laughs> they weren't that they weren't six feet or anything like that so it just blows my mind to see that something like height could keep somebody from being a firefighter and um saving people's lives like what does height have to do with any, any of that it just doesn't make sense yeah i think it's really horrible that as black people we could put so much into our country and we get nothing in return and i think it can be really evident today when we see the institutions such as the police institution be still upheld by certain white supremacist individuals as well as some laws in there that do trickle down from time before like from Jim Crow, we still see that those are the people that were enforcing these laws. And those laws, some of them are still there. In the book we're reading, we see how, even though, like Justice said before, de jure segregation, these things were legislative. And even in Norfolk up to 1990s, these laws were still in there with the explicit words that did, did signify <laughs> Black people. Like, okay, there were there were neighborhoods where they were technically segregated, but if a white person wanted to sell their house to a black family, they, a lot of the times, these government agencies would tell them that they were not allowed to do that, or they would not have any benefits, or they would not be able to receive mortgages and loans from other organizations and such. So we had, uh, there was an example in the book about Palo Alto, and that's the area around Stanford, if you know that school. And basically this family was trying to sell their house to a black person. And they were told that if they did, they wouldn't receive mortgages, they wouldn't receive loans from banks anymore. And it's 
crazy how much effort people put into this to be able to keep black people from buying houses. And even if they did like buy a house in a white neighborhood, that would just cause white flight. Like everyone would leave because they thought property value was going going to go down. They thought crime rates were going to go up just because of stereotypes. But they yes. don't even know the people that are living with them. Yes, and I think that's why it's so important that we have public communities in action right now in this day and age to help educate and really heal those racial wounds that have happened over years and years and years. So I'm so excited and so happy to be part of this organization. Me too. And big shout out to Public Communities in Action. We, we are really trying to fight and break through these barriers and change minds and change the world. Yeah, especially the read to lead one. I just know me personally, I really want that program to come up again. The idea of educating our youth in the right way, we just, like, we are the future of tomorrow. It is really important. Anyone at any age are, like, being educated so we could, like, fix the problems that are still evident today. It also, it um shows, like, with all the stuff that we've gone over just tonight, it shows that, it just shows how much they do just trying to oppress us like we literally built the entire country literally and they still kill us and throw us in prison as if we like they owe it like we owe them something it just show it just shows how like what do we do to make these people this mad or like dislike us this much other than the complexion of our skin and the curls in our hair like it's crazy like um the segregated housing kind of ended in the 1950s with Shelley versus Kramer, which is like a huge court case. You don't even learn about it in school though, because I learned about maybe like 10 other court cases that happened in US history, but I never learned about this because we didn't even touch on redlining. I don't, I never learned about redlining through school period. And that's crazy to me because Shelley versus Kramer, that's 60 years ago. That's not a lot of time for people to be able to gain financial mobility. Um, we literally have a comment that says like the 90s, like, wow, like, yeah, like it wasn't, you act like it was like so long ago, but it really wasn't. Like I said in the last one, like my dad, like literally went through that as a kid. Like that's my dad. Like you act like it was like 400 years ago, it was only slavery, but it wasn't. Like you said, like still in the 90s, there's so many um, barriers that are trying to keep us from succeeding. Yeah, we on Juneteenth, we actually went to the area of Tidewater Park and it is genuinely crazy to me. In our next topic, we are going to talk more about gentrification, but these things are happening now, which is crazy. Like we read about it and it seems like it's history, but this is happening now and i think that's just crazy and they, i think they just locked up george floyd's killer but it's crazy how long it took for him to get locked up if it wasn't a, like if it didn't have such a global backlash on it i don't think the officer would have went to jail because plenty of african americans are killed by cops like every day and most of that stuff doesn't even hit the news like they try to make it seem like we don't see it we see it it's just that we say stuff about it and it's shut down. It's like, it just they just cut it off. So, yeah. One of our yeah. viewers, sorry. One of our viewers had asked, Rodney Jordan asked, why do you think these issues or topics are not discussed in school? I, I can answer that. Um, I think that because I think the teachers don't want us to like have conflict. Uh, like, so basically, like okay so white teachers right we have white teachers maybe okay so i don't want to say nothing rude but the white teachers maybe not have may not may not have like the information to give us to like actually let us learn about our history back in the day and then and then maybe they don't want us to like have conflict and like mm. I think the reason, the real reason, well, another reason why we don't learn about this stuff in school is because the government doesn't want to see, be seen as bad. Like, that's bad. Yeah. They, try keep, they try to shield us from this stuff. Like, 
that's why like a lot of people like depending on where you grow up like you'll never know about any of this stuff just because of who you're around like for example like i've been around african americans for most of my life and but before before like five six i thought that my skin color was wrong just because everybody else around me was white i didn't even consider myself black i considered myself brown i didn't want to consider myself well i want to consider myself i just didn't know that i was black because of all the people around me the government doesn't want to be seen as the public enemy because when that happens nobody trusts them and when we stop to trust them then they can't get away with all this other stuff that they do and shove down our throats yeah Oh, oh, and Jordan, just like what you were saying is so true. Like, I know it's kind of hard to like speak about that specifically, but definitely diversity does make a learning space better. It does like literacy rates and everything does go up when it's like a diverse classroom and or just like diverse teachers. So what you were saying was like totally true. Yeah, I think that like a lot of um, white parents don't really want their kids to know about the real history behind it, um, just because of like racist undertones, which was ridiculous. Because last week, Calissa said like white history is like shoved down our throats, but like black history, like we have like what like one month where we talk about the same five people over again. But there's so much more than that, and like us as like black kids we are like robbed of our entire history and that's like one of the worst things that the school system could have done because without knowing about what happened like how are we just not repeat it or like go forth and changing it so um jason Cookman asked this or they commented this they said i heard that they're about to tear tidewater uh curry and the young's park do y'all know anything about that so we actually have our meetings in the St. Paul's and Tidewater Park area, and they are tearing down basically the entire complex. And they're, there's a lot of flooding down in Norfolk. So they're trying to take part of the neighborhood and create it into a lake to help drainage, I guess. But with doing that, they're not going to have enough houses to put everybody that they move out back into those original houses. So I'm not sure the exact number of houses that they have now, I just know that there's going to be significantly less. So we're going to have a lot of families that are going to be displaced there. And they actually, they actually have sued Norfolk for this. Yeah. And when we were there, we did like talk to lots of people. And one thing that I found really sad on my way to the meeting is that there were just these ladies sitting outside their houses and there were numbers on their houses. Like these numbers are the order that they are going to be torn down. And the city is not seeing this as lives. Like public housing does have a horrible history. Um, and the upkeep is obviously not great. And the conditions do need to be way better. Um, but the fact that these people are being displaced with no sure way to go, they were promised that they would build houses back. But like Calissa said, it's going to be significantly less. Not everyone is going to have a place to go. People are going to become homeless. So it it's genuinely horrible that these are people's lives that are being affected. Yeah, like a lot of big companies don't really view it as like lives, like livelihoods being taken, but more as like an, an opportunity to make more money. And that is really selfish and unfair to the people who are already there. Okay. Y'all, we're going to actually wrap this section up. We're going to head over into our intermission and we're going to show y'all a clip that we actually took um, asking questions to residents in Tidewater Park. So that kind of does tie in. And I'm going to load that up for y'all now. My name is Linda Cooper. Well, I met my children's father in Tower Park. <laughs> I had three children. Um, and Tower Park was more, going back to the 60s and 70s, were more family oriented. Um, everybody looked out for everybody. If you were on the streets, people knew that that was somebody's brother or somebody's sister or somebody's mother. And people respected that. I understand um, 
things change over time. Um, I, I look at it as if, if they're not going to, in which I don't believe that state is going to put money into rebuilding the park. But, you know, the word is that they want to rebuild and that residents can move back. I personally don't believe that all of those residents will be able to move back based on income. Um, and if they do, it would be awesome. I just left one of my friends. Um, she lived in Tidewater Park over 53 years and her biggest fear is moving. And she doesn't think she would live long enough to come back. So if they were to rebuild, it would be nice to bring some of the older ones back first. I have fun memories um, and I do understand over time things change and um, I'm all for change. Um, I just pray that even in the midst of change that you respect people as being people regardless of uh, their origin, color or whatever, education, you still, people are people, we're human and we're flesh and blood and I think regardless of change you just always remember that people are people. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that brief intermission. That was a clip that we took on Juneteenth. Um, and now Jordan and I will go into a little bit of an explanation on blockbusting. Jordan, take it away. Okay, so first let's start off with what is the definition of blockbusting. So essentially blockbusting is when um, certain companies convince white people that black people are taking over their neighborhoods and buy their property from them. Then they turn around and sell to the property uh, of black people for higher prices. So, and then some firms would go as to hire African-Americans to go into white neighborhoods and portray stereotypes to scare white people into, into selling their land. Um, yeah. And so blockbusting kind of like really promoted white flight because they use terms like Negro invasion as a scare tactic and negative in stereotypes influence white people to have long lasting impressions of black people that have been passed down and they're still enforced today. And so blockbusting was kind of a huge contributor into the gentrification that occurred like later down the road. Um, yeah. So <laughs> were you saying something oh, i was just saying um yeah so yeah when the war ended and the people were able to move out of the public housing projects especially for the military black people were forced to stay there because they were uh denied loans and they and their homes were making these places slums and ghettos yeah, and um, I never really explained what gentrification was, but it's basically the process of renovating and improving a district infrastructure and housing and typically displaces current inhabit inhabitants in the process. Um, Jordan, I think you have a map that kind of shows how gentrification correlates to redlining. Yes, I do. Okay, so I want to share my screen. Sorry, you guys. Okay. I need access. Okay, thank you. So basically this map right here is, this is Old Huntersville. And then this, you can't really see, it's not bolded like Old Huntersville is, but this part right here is Ghent. And so as you can see, um, Old Huntersville right here has more, uh, so this map, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, let me go back a little bit. So this map is about, crimes that happen in um, Norfolk. And then this area is obviously Old Huntersville versus uh, Ghent. And so as you can see, Ghent has lower rates, lower crime rates than Old Huntersville right here because the dark blue is the highest. And then obviously the lower colors of blue is um, lowest. And so the crime is a direct result of unequal wealth distribution distribution and lack of access to resources. So um, when when you like when you force a group of people to stay in that 
place for so long and they have no resources to be able to um, do things, they start to steal from people and the violence go up. And then when you have an area where there are a lot of resources, the crime rates aren't really that high. So that's basically it. Yeah, it's just like proof that like lack of resources leaves black people with less options and and then uh, unfortunately also enforces negative stereotypes, which isn't fair because really what else are you supposed to do? Yes. Um, you can see a lot of examples of it in Norfolk right now too. That map. So hello guys, I'm gonna be giving you some information about gentrification specifically in Norfolk. So the FHA spurred suburbanization by only insuring loans for people in suburban white areas and denied black Americans from the war those loans. So no matter how much help that we did, especially what Diani was talking about before, black veterans were not given the resources that white Americans were. And two thirds of all wealth today is tied to home equity value. So when we look back to this public housing crisis, that directly correlates to today. It's it's genuinely like horrible that the fact that whatever happened in the past still affects today and people choose not to acknowledge it. So Ghent has had segregated wartime housing for naval yards. And then in the 1960s, the NRHA declared Ghent a conservation zone. The FHA issued federally insured loans to almost exclusively white buyers, and many black families were ineligible and forced out of Ghent, which we could see today when we look at the population up there. In the 1970s, the NRHA demolished East Ghent and promised that they would build low income housing in its place, but instead they ran out of federal funds and sold it to private developers. So we could definitely see that today by how they are demolishing the Tidewater Park area and are planning to gentrify it. And I think it's just so crazy that all that stuff happened in the 70s and it is literally repeating today. And I'm about to show you guys some information about the schools in that area. So this is Booker T. Washington High School, which is in Tidewater Park. And we can see the minority enrollment of the school. We could see the population up there. And also when we look at Maury High School, we could see that the population of white individuals is 33% versus how it was at Maury, um, versus how it was at Booker T. And then when we look at their national rankings, 12,000 is where Booker T. Washington is. It is a lot, a lot lower than where Maury High School is. And when we look at the economic status of these places, obviously Booker T. Washington, due to previous redlining, is a lot lower. So I think it is just really important that we see that this is affecting today. This is affecting our youth today. And when our youth has to grow up, when we have to grow up in these conditions that were due to legislation from before, it's really important that we read about this and that we educate everyone about it because this stuff, we really need to dismantle it. And things like CCA and the Read to Lead program and the Virtual Village program, which is kids teaching kids, like we need these things. And I think it's truly amazing. Yeah, it's super inspiring for like, black kids to see other black kids who are educated because then they're also going to want to be educated and they're like they can be educated too it's not you're not stuck in the stigma that the world has put on you okay so now we're going to engage in an open discussion and answer some of the questions that we might have missed before All right, so Lauren Williams asked, what do you think would help ease the racism today and what should black students now do now? Um, well, I think to ease the social racism, I think we all need to come to an understanding and, and to a realization that it's there. It is not gone anymore just because we don't have Jim Crow laws and segregation. It's still there today. And I think that's a huge barrier right now and that would help us um, e <laughs> to ease it and to hopefully one day get rid of racism because racism sucks. 
Yeah, totally. I think that like talking about it also is, I feel like it shouldn't be some like big bad thing that we should not never talk about. Like it's something that happened, something that's happening. And the only really way to dismantle it is to educate the future. And that's us and the people younger than us who don't know and they need to. Adding on to what Selena said, I think we like, I know teachers aren't allowed to talk politics in their classroom or give their own political bias for certain reasons. And I do understand that. But I do think that school should be a place where we are taught how to talk about politics respectfully so that we can be able to have peaceful discussions with one another about what's going on so that everyone can understand other people's struggles besides theirs. Because a lot of people don't care about issues that don't affect them. Yeah, totally, Calissa. And like, even then, I don't even think it's really politics. It's just the blatant racism that's right in front of us. So. So, Mac Anderson asked, do you think critical race theory education would help more people learn and understand their heritage? So, one thing that we have talked about in our class is that critical race theory is a really big thing, and it's really often used in the wrong way. Um, we have one college student with us who is taking that class, and people kind of really throw around the term. And I think critical race theory in some people's eyes is just blatant. People think it's like just anti-America, but in school, we learn a lot about the white side of things or sorry, yeah, about the white side of things or just like anything from like an oppressive nature. Like I know in our last show, we talked about how there's an AP European history and I just got an African-American elective like this year. Um, it's it's genuinely like crazy, but I personally think that this, it's not critical, it's not theory at all. Like critical race theory is its own separate thing and the term is being thrown around a lot, but the idea of black education is just history. Like it, it's nothing different than that. Yeah, totally. Like we all know about Christopher Columbus, but. <laughs> so Anita Harris, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, asks, uh, why do you think it's important for students of all races to learn about systemic racism? And I think we kind of touched on this a little bit, but it's just important to learn about different aspects of other people's culture. And this is not just for black people. This is for everyone, really, because there are issues within every race that need to be addressed and we just don't learn about any of it. Yeah, like, that's exactly right. Like right on the money there. Because, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying to listen. Oh, I was gonna say I agree with that because I think that America itself is one of the countries that we really invented race and what that means. Other places when you go to Britain, if you're born there, you're just British. You're not really they don't really call you black British. Asian British, there's, you're just British if you were born there in that country. In America, if you're born Asian in America, you're an Asian American. Why can't you just be an American? And I think that really plays into the how much systemic racism is dove into our country. And and that's why I really think it's so important we for all students and for every race to acknowledge it and and really understand it. Therefore, hopefully one day we can get rid of it because it's really does not need to be here. Yeah, I think it's absolutely horrible how systemic racism is just things that affect us today, but people do make it, attribute it to people's personal personalities. Like when people see the black people in slums and these concentrated areas, that is due to government legislation. Yeah, and back on what um, I said, of course there's like so the out. I, oh, am I? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm, I'm going to move on to the comment because you're still coming out. So, okay. Kirkman asks, okay. how do you feel about Black people taking care of themselves as a solution like Black Wall Street? How long do you feel that Blacks should continue to deal with racism? So I'll, I'll answer that. I love the idea of being able to take care of yourself, but the the government and 
white people don't like that at all. So you said like Black Wall Street, the the government set stuff up just so that would get shut down. <laughs> like every time we try to uprise, they shut it down. We had hip, we created hip hop in the Bronx, and they created the crack epi- the crack epidemic just to make sure that didn't get too big. And we rioted, and they shut that down too. It's like every time we try to prove something, they shut it down. It was like if we could find a way how to just stop them from just stop like it's like every time we try to make cultural developments for our people they say no they make sure that they oppress us but they make it seem like they didn't do it they make it seem like it's your you're your own problem but it's actually them in control of all of that and with Tulsa or Black Wall Street, they um, they burned it down the first time. It was people, they were mad that Black people were prospering. But then the second time, it got, like, they had rebuilt, but it got completely shut down the second time because they gentrified the neighborhood under the premise that they were going to build a highway system. So basically, all the residents were moved out. They were forced to move out. They had nowhere else to go at that point. And they ended up building highways over our success. Yep. And yeah. for that, I was saying for that second question, I wonder if you feel that black should continue to deal with racism. That's that's a very hard question because I feel like we should have never had to deal with it in the first place. You white people brought us here. You brought us here to work for you and build your houses, build your white house, and and now you want to just throw us to the curb and be disrespectful to us, not give us anything. I feel like it's, it's, we should not have to deal with it. We should have never had to deal with it. So if I had it my way, would be, we wouldn't have to deal with it anymore from this point on. <laughs> yeah, and Justice, when you started talking about like the crack epidemic, that is something that I know I could talk about forever, but that is literal legislation that's in, that is completely, disproportionately incarcerating black individuals and like the differences between like Nixon's war on drugs and crack cocaine and powder cocaine and how one is more used by white individuals, one's more used by black individuals. It's the same exact drug, but guess what, which one like had a jail time. And it is absolutely crazy how much black people could prosper and the government, which is currently run by many white supremacists do anything to tear us down and that's why education is so important that's why everything is so important like it's it's genuinely so crazy how this is in our law and people are saying that we shouldn't be educated about this like it's not anti-american it's american and this is why we need to fix what's in america we need to fix the government we need to fix everything or else we're not going to be able to ever prosper and like back to the previous question was like why do you think it's not really being taught? Well, maybe because like like Justice said, the government really doesn't want it to be taught because a lot of people in power right now, like they're not really anti racist. Like they can say that they are, but like do they really take action towards it? Not really. Yes. Jordan. Um, so here we have another question asking, why do you think some members of the dominant culture are so against leveling the playing field for all people? I love this question so much because I think the perfect answer to this is because they know that as African Americans, if they did level the playing field, we would win. We would be in every high power position. We would have the government because we are smart, strong, intellectual individuals and they just want to keep us down. Why else would you, would you, um, like when you're in a race, you're not going to attack the person who you think is the weakest player. No, you're going to attack the strongest competitor because you want to win and you know that they can beat you. This is, but this is not a game, this is life. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, close that you can go. No, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna say, like, especially with my parents, they're both immigrants. My mom's from Trinidad, my dad is from Nigeria. And when they came here, they endured lots of culture shocks, especially my dad. Like, when he came here, he's now a doctor, but all that he had to go through going to University of Alabama, 
that he has lots of stories about that, but I know he had to work harder than his white classmates to be where he is today. And I think that's like one of the reasons like we have been pushed down so much and all the things that we have endured to get where we are, like we are educated black youth and they try to like not get that for us. Like lots of us are in like AP classes. Lots of us are like gonna do really good things. Diani, you're going to college, our other Kennedy who's not here today, but she's going to Howard. Like they tried to suppress us so much. And I I think if we were given the opportunities handed to us, like some people do, we, we would be up there, yeah. So Mark Anderson asks, do you believe there is a lack of black leadership that hinders our growth and develop as people? Um, I don't, so, one thing about black leadership is that there are a lot of black leaders, but how many of the black leaders are telling us the right thing, if you know what I mean? For example, a black leader for like people, like a lot of African-American culture has to go with hip hop and the stuff that they say in hip hop isn't necessarily the greatest thing to go by, not just knocking them down or anything. But when a white person, comes to look at us they're like oh they're talking about sex money drugs stuff of that matter they're like there's no meaning to this they don't want to listen but if like like i don't really know who the most influential african-american person is right now so it makes it um like hard to follow and yeah i agree with what you're saying oh go ahead okay i was gonna say i agree because I feel like when you're growing up, it's hard to imagine yourself doing a leadership role when you see nobody else doing that and doing it in a way in which empowers you to want to change the world. Rappers, yes, it's a leadership role they're talking, but I feel like we needed someone, and I think we have that change that will help that will help young people want to change the world because that's what will I think really young people are the next generation those are the people who will change these things in life not saying that the older people can't but the younger people have the power to do so and i feel like we just needed that i think for me i personally see a lot of young black leaders however it's it's the question about how many of those young people are going to be able to be leaders in the future because they're constantly being pushed down now you have so many microaggressions and bullying in school that it makes you feel a lot smaller than you actually are and it takes a lot of unlearning and growing to be able to be a leader as an adult i think because there's just there's so much to being an adult and so much responsibility that you have on your shoulder and it's different it's kind of different when you're young so it's harder to be a black leader as an adult i think because you're being pushed down from that young age Another thing about black leaders is that a lot of the time when like you're actually successful, they try to either kill you or kill your reputation. Like, I don't know what exactly happened with Bill Cosby, but they like he ended up in jail after all that. He's like he was like the most influential person, African-American person of like the 90s, early 2000s. And just to see him going to jail, it just it's my like so so it makes you think it makes you question if he was a good guy or a bad guy just based off the allegations and stuff that happened. But now he's free, so it's like it's everywhere. You can't like they 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 they're killing his reputation. And with Malcolm and Dr. Martin Luther King, they killed them, but that made them even more famous. So it, it basically backfired. But they still, that's like when they started killing reputations rather than actually killing the person because it makes them look like a public enemy rather than a public hero, like they did Malcolm and Dr. Martin Luther King. Yes. Um, a lot of rappers push so heavy in pop culture is that stereotype. And so black people don't really have a lot of leaders. I think that, like, in media in general, there's not a lot of good representation, like, even in movies. The people that they hire, like in the roles, like they still push the stereotypes. Um, and like, there's never really like that good representation of African Americans or literally just African people anywhere. Like you, like I used to work in a daycare and these little kids who had 
mentioned before, YouTube, but they don't watch TV. So, okay, so and, who's cutting out again? Oh my Emma, yes. so annoying. Okay, Selena. <laughs> well, basically, Selena, she works in the daycare, and I think she was saying, because she's told us to us before that, like, they didn't, the kids in her daycare have never really seen black people, so they were kind of like, oh, you're dark skin. That's new. Yeah. Because and they were, I think, like, oh, continue, go ahead. Okay, no, yeah, Selena, are you working again? <laughs> no, I was just saying thank you. Okay. Yeah. Why? Because I don't know when that's gonna happen or why, but yeah. yeah, it's it's like lots of like today, like black people dominate like the athletic industry as well as like the music industry, and in culture today, especially in, like movies and TV shows, lots of the black representation have a proximity to whiteness that is not very representative of their viewership, and I think especially with athletics, it's like some of the only ways certain communities can get, um, sorry, <laughs> um, like only way certain people can like get out and like some people like can't afford college like by themselves and sports scholarships are like best way to do that. Um, and I think especially with leadership, I think that's why community leadership is really important. Like, especially clever communities and actions, people like Miss Star and stuff, like we have these people with us. But for some people who don't have access to, uh, easily to these programs, like media would be a great place to have it. And I know for sure, like rappers have like this bad represent like rep rep representation and stuff. But I think that's just because that is the thing that white people want to push. They want to push this idea that it kind of is just about drugs and sex, and that's the life of someone who lives in these horrible areas. But it's a sad thing. Like, hood culture and stuff, white people have tried to make that into, like, kind of almost an aesthetic, like something that's, like, cool. And I think people try to enjoy what you're in, but we have to fix these things. Like my family, like before we lived here, I know my mom, like she lived in a village. My dad, they lived in villages. It was not good. I know like my aunts, like they were in Brooklyn before it was gentrified. And like, this, it was not like a good life. And of course people enjoyed it, but this is not things that we want to glorify for ourselves that it's like slums and stuff. Like we want the prosperity. Yeah, and our family can be our black leaders. Like, example, like my uncle, he never did drugs. He went to college. He he even lived out old Huntersville, where I live now, and he is he is successful. He's he um he moved out old Huntersville. He's not living here. Like, we can rely on our families to be our black leaders if these celebrities can't, or if our teachers can't be our um our leaders. Yeah. All right, guys. I think we are pretty much almost out of time. But thank you for your great comments and questions. Um, I had a great time with you guys tonight. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Clever Communities one more time because they really are the reason why we're here. And don't forget to tune in to Virtual Villagers tomorrow at one o'clock. I am a law scholar. I am a powerful force. I use literacy as a weapon for liberation. I use literacy as a weapon to uncover hidden truth. I am a young change agent. I have been handed the baton by my ancestors. I have the support and protection of my community. I am an asset to my community. I understand that I have the responsibility to empower my community as I choose my path in life. I am a law scholar and I use literacy as a weapon to 